All right, in this video, I want to talk a little bit about inverse functions and just sort of the basic properties of inverse functions. And to try to make you know a little conceptual sense out of what an inverse function is, I'm going to start with a little example. So suppose we have f of x equals the cube root of x plus 1, and g of x is the quantity x minus 1 cubed. I'm just going to take a couple numbers uh, and, and just play with them here a little bit. So suppose we take x equals 8. And suppose we plug that into our function f of x. So, well, we would get f of 8, which would be the cube root of 8 plus 1. Well, the cube root of 8 is 2. So we'll have 2 plus 1, which is 3. OK, fine. Let's take this new number, 3, and let's plug that into our other function, g of x. So then we would get g of 3. Well, g of 3 would be 3 minus 1 cubed. 3 minus 1 is going to be 2. So really, we have 2 cubed. And we get the number 8 as our uh, answer. So notice, we start with the number x equals 8. We plug it into one function. We get some new number, whatever it is. We plug that into the other one. And after we do the arithmetic, we're right back where we started. Um, maybe one more value here. What's another number we can take the cube root of? Um, how about x equals, let's use a negative, negative 27. So if we start with uh, f of negative 27, well, we'll get the cube root of negative 27 plus 1. The cube root of negative 27 is going to be negative 3. So we get negative 3 plus 1, which is going to be negative 2. OK, so again, let's take this new number, negative 2, and let's plug that into our g function. So in that case, we'll get negative 2 minus 1 cubed, or negative 3 cubed. Again, which is negative 27. We're back where we started. Okay? And I claim you can check this uh, for as long as you want until you get bored. Plug in you know, as many different values of x. Um, plug it into f. You'll get something new. Plug it into g. You'll see you always get back the original number. And it works in reverse, too. You could start with any number, plug it into g, you'll get something new. Then go backwards, uh, plug it into f, and you'll see you get back the original starting value. This is the big idea of an inverse function. The idea of an inverse function is somehow they undo each other. You start with something, f changes it, g changes it back. Okay, same thing in the next one. You start with some number, uh, f changes it to a new number, g changes it back to the original number. So drum roll, if I had sound effects. Uh, that's the big idea. Uh, a function f of x and its inverse, which we write as little f to the negative 1 of x, assuming it has an inverse. Not all functions have inverses. The idea of a function and its inverse is that somehow they undo each other. Okay, That's the big idea. Somehow they cancel each other out. And we have inverse operations in you know mathematics. Addition and subtraction are inverse operations. Uh, multiplication and division are inverse operations. We say that they mean they somehow kind of undo each other. So again, I said notation-wise, uh, we use this this new uh, little f to the negative one of x. So in this case, since f of x and g of x are inverses, instead of labeling this function g of x, I could simply write x minus one cubed equals this little f to the negative one of x. Again, we read this as f inverse of x. Okay, so here's f of x, here's f inverse of x. Okay, a big word of warning, okay, so don't do this, although I'm sure I've done it. Okay, so warning, you know, this, this little inverse sign is not an exponent. This little negative 1 is not an exponent. So this is not the same thing as 1 over f of x, okay? It would be nice if, if that's all you had to do to find the inverse. It would make it simple. But, I mean, you can even check, right? I mean, if these are the inverse functions, if you take 1 over the cube root of x plus 1, you don't get this function, x minus 1 cubed. Okay? It's definitely not just 1 over the original. So be careful about that. Um, it's, again, it's kind of an easy mistake. Um, kind of bad notation, I, I think. Okay, so a couple of things here. Do all functions have inverses? Well, I kind of gave that one away, and we said no. Okay, well, um, 
Why not? Well, maybe let's take an example. And actually, um, let's revisit our last example real quick. There's one more little idea that's worth pointing out. Notice we had our function f of x was the cube root of x plus 1. And we called the other f inverse of x, we said that was x minus 1 cubed. Notice in the first uh, problem, we plugged in the number, I believe we started with the number 8. All right, we plugged in 8, we got the cube root of 8 to be 2, and then 2 plus 1 was 3. Okay, so we could say that the point 8 comma 3 would be a point on this graph of f of x, because again, we're just plotting points. If you plug in x equals 8, you'll get y equals 3. But notice, since they undo each other, when we plugged 3 into our inverse function, right, we get 3 minus 1, which is 2. 2 cubed is, hey, 8, okay? So we start with 8, we got out 3, we plug 3 into the new function, we got back 8. Notice the x and y point flip-flopped, okay? Likewise, when we started with negative 27, we got negative 3 plus 1, which is negative 2. When we plug negative 2 into our inverse function, we got negative 2 uh, minus 1, which was negative 3. Negative 3 cubed is negative 27. Okay, so this is an important idea. For functions that do have inverses, if you know a point on one graph, so if we know 8, 3 is on one graph, that means if you switch those, 3, 8 is going to be a point on the inverse graph. So again, negative 27, negative 2 was a point on our uh, graph f. If you switch those, that means automatically that negative 2 comma negative 27 is going to be on the inverse graph. And again, that's just because, you know, they undo each other. It's just a consequence of that. Nothing, nothing more sophisticated than that. Okay, so keep that idea in mind. Do all, inverse, do all functions have inverse functions? Uh, and I claim no, and why not? Suppose we take a nice simple function, like say y equals x squared. Well, just at random, well not completely at random, if I plug in 2, so this is not the scale, if you plug in 2 you get out 4. If you plug in negative 2, notice you also get out the number 4. Okay, so if we think about this as being our function f of x, when you go to sketch, you know, maybe we try to just graph the inverse. Again, and we're going to graph the inverse, if it exists, um, as a function by just switching out ordered pairs, right? We just said if you, if you take the points and reverse them, you get a point on the new graph, the new function. So in this case, since 2, 4 is on the original graph, that means that 4, 2 would be on my inverse graph. But likewise, if negative 2, 4 is on the graph of the original function, that means 4, negative 2 is going to be on the graph of the inverse. And already, remember to be a function, it has to pass that vertical line test. And this uh, inverse graph would definitely fail the vertical line test, which means that it's not a function. Okay, so the idea is if you have, you know, different x values that have the same y value, what's going to happen is you're going to create points that fail this vertical line test. So the idea is we can use what's called the horizontal line test. Whew, it's a bad graph or I'm a bad drawer. It's supposed to be going through the same points. We can use what's called the horizontal line test. And if you draw a horizontal line and it hits your graph in more uh, than one place, then we say uh, it fails the horizontal line test, and as a consequence, um, it's going to be not a function. Okay, so it's bad that it's hitting twice is the idea. Well, which functions do have inverses? Well, the types of functions that do have inverses um, are functions that pass the horizontal line test. Okay, maybe you've seen exponential functions. Uh, so here's. Maybe you haven't. Uh, either way, it's okay. So here's some function 2 to the x. And if you haven't seen exponentials, don't worry about that. Again, the big idea is that 
this function is now going to pass this horizontal line test. No matter where I put a horizontal line, it's going to hit the graph in at most one place. And it kind of looks like it's flattening out here to the left, but it always does keep decreasing uh, just a little bit. Um, notice a couple things. If you plug in 0, 2 to the 0 is 1. If we plug in x equals 1, we would get 1 comma 2. If we were to plug in um, 2, we would get 2 comma 4, etc. You could plug in some more points. Well, um, what we can conclude, you know, maybe we can try to sketch the graph of the inverse a little bit. Um, if we try to do this, let me sketch a couple more points over here. So I claim, and again, if you haven't seen inverse functions, that's fine. Um, this would be the point negative 1 comma 1 half. If we plug in negative 2, if you plug in negative 2, you'll actually get the, the y value of 1 fourth. So let's use this idea of sort of a, you know, sort of a taking points and flip-flopping them to sketch the inverse function. Okay, so, so it says that 2, 4 is on the graph. That means that 4, 2 is going to be on the graph of the inverse. So there's 4, 2. 1, 2 was on the graph of f. So that means 2, comma 1 is going to be on the graph of the inverse. 0, 1 is on the graph of f. That means 1, 0 is on the graph of the inverse. It says negative 1, 1 half is on f. That means 1 half and negative 1 is going to be on the inverse. It says negative 2, comma, 1 fourth is on f. That means 1 fourth, uh, negative 2 is going to be on the inverse. And you can actually keep this up and you can sketch the graph of the inverse by simply plotting points on 1 and flipping those points to get the sketch of the inverse function. Okay? This is something again that's important. Okay? So one more kind of let's summarize this idea um, and then we'll be finished in this video. So lots of little things here about inverses. Definitely crucial things, you know, if you're doing any sort of algebra or calculus or have to take these classes very much. All very fundamental ideas here. So so again, let's kind of make a conclusion based on our last example. Let's summarize what we did. Okay, so we said a couple things. So here was our function f. This was our inverse function. We said a couple things uh, in that last bit. We said uh, functions that pass the horizontal line test those functions have uh, inverse functions. Okay, so that's an important idea. Let's see, so let's summarize everything. Um, what's the idea of an inverse function? So a function f of x and its inverse undo each other. So how do you find an inverse? Well, I definitely have videos about how to find the inverse of a function. So take a look for those if you need those. Um, what functions have inverses? Well, functions that pass the horizontal line test. Those have inverse functions. Um, notice uh, if, if, we know, if we know one point, so if AB is on our function f of x, well, that says that the point BA is on F inverse of X. And really, that's kind of double arrowed. Uh, if we know a point on one function, we really know a point on the other. Let's take this idea a little bit further. Let's uh, point out two more things here, and then uh, I think we'll be finished. Okay, let's think about this idea. If, if, if AB is on F of X and BA is on the inverse, notice the X coordinates Okay, which is the domain. So the domain of f of x, because you take all the x coordinates, the x coordinates turn into the y coordinates of the inverse function. So really the domain of your original function f of x is going to be the same thing as the range of the inverse function. And likewise the range of f of x Well, those are the y-coordinates. Those are now going to turn into the new x-coordinates. So the domain, or excuse me, the range of f of x is going to turn into the domain of the inverse function. That's another very crucial idea. 
The last thing here is kind of this geometry. A consequence, if, if AB is on one graph and BA is therefore on the other graph, the way that you can get the graph of a function at its inverse is by reflecting about the line y equals x. Okay, so here's the line y equals x. Notice if you take, uh, so here's my graph f of x, hopefully this will show up, I'm going to try to shade him a little funny here. If I were to take my, you know, if I were to take my paper and ref I'm just going to bend it along that crease y equals x. Notice that now I'm getting exactly, this looks like to me f inverse of x, right? It's the function we had right here. Okay, so you bend it, hey, there it is. You bend it, there it is. So this is another nice little property. If you start with some function, f, it's very easy to get the graph of its inverse just by reflecting it and then, you know, saying, ah, there it is. You know, this is still obviously the x-axis, the positive x-axis. This is, would be the negative y-axis. So everything's still, you know, in the same, uh, same orientation as before. So, uh, so to get the graph of f inverse of x, we can reflect f of x about the line y equals x. Okay, so, whew. Probably a long little video here. Um, lots of very basic properties. You know, this is true. For, these work for inverse trig functions. Uh, you know, hey, if you've seen exponentials and logarithms, those are inverses of each other. Um, so just very useful uh, uh, basic properties. Um, again, I've got some videos about how to find exactly, uh, you know, inverse functions and other things. But again, I hope this helps. I hope these ideas make some sense. Definitely worth thinking about. Um, and uh, all right, I hope it helps you out out there.